Good evening. Hello, everyone. My name is Phoebe Myers. I am the Community Program Senior Manager at the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies. Thank you all so much for being here, virtually tuning in to our first virtual naturalist night of the season. I am joining you alone here from the uh, classroom at Hallam Lake in Aspen, Colorado, wishing we could all be here together. Uh, please take a moment to say hello the, um, in the chat and let us know where you're tuning in from. It looks like we have over 80 people here joining so far and uh, more are tuning on. So uh, thank you so much. Naturalist Nights is a free speaker series offered in the Roaring Fork Valley of Colorado in partnership between the Aspen Center for Environmental Studies, Wilderness Workshop, and Roaring Fork Audubon. This year's Naturalist Nights includes five presentations. We have made the decision to go virtual with the first two presentations in January. And alongside our partners, we will continue to monitor the COVID levels here in our valley and uh, as our, the winter continues. I, all the presentations will be recorded and posted on each of our organization's websites. Grassroots TV is also airing all of our talks on Channel 12 Up Valley and Channel 82 Down Valley. We are also live streaming these talks uh, on both ACES and Wilderness Workshops Facebook page and YouTube pages. There will be a question and answer session at the end of tonight's talk. And we encourage you to ask questions and we want to hear from you. If you are jo joining via Zoom, you can use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you're joining through Facebook or YouTube, just chat, put your questions in the chat box and we'll make sure to read them as well. Um, we would also love to thank our generous sponsors tonight. Um, these businesses provide in-kind and financial donations which cover expenses and make these talks possible. Tonight's featured sponsor is Craig Ward of Aspen Snowmass Sotheby's. Thank you so much, Craig, for your support. The next Virtual Naturalist Nights presentation will be live online in two weeks on Thursday, January 27th at 6 p.m. Dr. Cortland Kelly is a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Soil and Crop Science at Colorado State University, and she will be presenting on soil carbon in Colorado agroecosystems, practice and promise. But for tonight, I'm going to turn this over to Chris Daniels of the Roaring Fork Audubon Society to introduce tonight's speaker. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Chris Daniels from the Roaring Fork Audubon Society. And uh, tonight, we're very excited to have Scott Rashid here. Scott is the director of the Colorado Avian Research and Re Rehabilitation Institute, or CARI. And as director, he creates and manages projects, including researching northern pygmy owls, northern sawwood owls, barn owls, northern goshawks, rosy finches, hummingbirds, and much, much more. And he also rehabilitates injured birds. Scott's also an artist uh, with his own unique style. Hopefully we'll see some of that tonight. And he operates banding stations each fall targeting saw wet and boreal owls. So without further ado, uh, I will turn it over to Scott. My name is Scott Rashid. Um, again, I'm from Estes Park. This, what you're seeing on the screen is just the end results of much of my research. I've been working with birds for a number of years and I like to create things that people can use to help them learn more about the birds themselves. I do a great deal when it comes to working with birds, um, but one of my favorite projects is the small owls I work with, and these include the boreal owl, the northern sawwet owl, the northern pygmy owl, and the flammulated owl. Before I start about the research, I'd just like to give a little background about who I am and, and kind of why I'm here. Um, first off, I started all this because I'm an artist. I'm a watercolor painter and I've created my own style of art where I combine uh, Pablo Picasso's concept of cubism and realism. Uh, I like the concept of showing multiple views of an image in each painting, but I like my work to be realistic. And so I use three images per painting because three is an uneven number and that often gives me a location within the painting to put a habitat scene to give the viewer an idea of what kind of habitat to find the bird in. And the birds, of course, all overlap. Uh, this is, of course, the western meadowlark. This is the ferruginous hawk. 
is a northern shrike, is a red and blackbird, <coughs> pileated woodpecker, northern pygmy owl. Also the director, as they said, of, of the Colorado Avian Research and Rehabilitation Institute, or CARI for short. We do research on hummingbirds, crows and other corvids, northern sawwood owls, kestrels, rosy finches, northern goshawks, sawwood owls. Again, we operate banding stations to get sawwood owls and boreal owls. I also operate a banding station at the YMCA of the Rockies. It, as far as I understand, is the oldest, longest run banding station operated by a single person. Uh, this year will be, will be my 22nd year banding birds there. So some of the results of what we've done to the research is I actually have banded more rosy finches than anybody in North America. I've banded over 5,500 rosy finches. And my oldest rosy finch lived to be 12 years old. Crows, I also banned more crows than anybody in Western North America. My oldest crow lived to be 10 years old. And I found out that the crows that actually are wintering in Estes Park actually nest in British Columbia and Alberta, Canada. Kestrels, I have 142 nest boxes placed for kestrels from South Denver, actually South Parker, all the way to the Wyoming border. And last year we um, raised 87 baby kestrels out of our boxes. Hummingbirds, I've one of three people in the state of Colorado licensed to ban hummingbirds. And my oldest hummingbird lived to be 10 years old. Again, northern sawwood owls, I have 140 nest boxes, excuse me, exactly 100 nest boxes for sawwood owls between um, Allen's Park and Drake. And I operate a banding station in the fall. You'll learn about where I actually trap and band northern sawwood owls. And one of my sawwood owls I caught in Estes Park was actually recovered live and released in Eastern Pennsylvania. This is a rose-breasted grosbeak. Again, I operate a banding station at the YMCA, and this is one of the birds we captured at the YMCA during our banding sessions. And this is a photograph you'll learn more about in a few minutes of the first documented boreal owl nest in the history of Rocky Mountain National Park that I documented in 2019. These are some of the birds we work with. I'm going to show just a little more in detail of some of the species that I'm real fond of. Uh, first, of course, the northern goshawk. Uh, it's a very large woodland hawk that nests in the mountains here and also where you guys are. And so I research the birds. I look for nesting sites, uh, territories. They'll start showing up um, usually in February and then return to their nest sites February and March. And then courtship will begin. Uh, that's with the male returning to the site. He'll fly throughout his territory, vocalizing, calling for a female. Um, and then this is one of the youngsters that fledged one of the nests that I watched. Long-eared owls, I actually had documented long-eared owls nesting in Longmont a few years ago. We put up nest baskets for long-eared owls because they do not build their nest. They need to use another structure of some type. So we put up these little baskets for them and had the birds use those and actually start nesting within these baskets. At one point, we only we had uh, two of the only three known long-eared owl nests in Boulder County. We also build nest boxes for them as well that they will sometimes use. This is a little uh, nestling long-eared owl. Barn owls, I've got uh, 33 barn owl nest boxes placed from Chatfield Reservoir to Wellington. I also have 10 barn owl boxes in Texas doing research on barn owls by increasing their numbers, putting up nest boxes, learning what their diet is, um, how they court nest and so forth. We actually have cameras on these nest boxes. So if you look at our website, you'll start to see as the owls return this spring, anytime now, you'll start seeing the barn owls in our nest boxes, which is kind of a fun thing to watch. Um, we watch them 24 seven. Uh, the activity inside the box is pretty impressive to see. I also do work with great horned owls. I've been working with great horned owls, uh, gosh, since the 80s. Uh, I've written a book about great horned owls. They nest in a variety of places. They feed on a massive amount of items from essentially anything from insects to half-grown turkeys. Um, this is one of those couple of little fledglings. This is one of the adult birds. I also rehabilitate birds. This is one of the great horned owls that I, I rehabilitated. And this is a photograph was taken just a few minutes before I let the bird go. But tonight I'm going to talk to you about what I call small mountain owls. 
um, and it's a bird, a series of birds I really enjoy. Um, first, of course, is the northern pygmy owl. And they are unique among owls in many ways, which you'll learn about here in just a minute. Uh, first of all, uh, most owls, like the barn owls and long-eared owls, have very long wings and very short tails, simply because of most times they're hunting out in the open, over the big open meadows, and those long wings enables them to, to have a great deal of lift, maneuverability in the open fields. But pygmy owls are built just the opposite. They have very short wings and very long tails, very much like an exhibitor or a sharp-shinned hawk, a cooper's hawk, because pygmy owls spend a great deal of their time in the woods. And they're active during the day only. They have, they're have they not active at night like other owls. They're only active during the day. And their short, rounded wings and long tails allows them to maneuver through the woods very rapidly chasing their prey. The um, scientific name of the pygmy owl is Glossidium noma, which means the glaring gnome, because they have a very kind of plain gray or brown body color and very bright yellow eyes. And they have a very unique adaptation. In the back of the bird, they have eye spots that actually look more like eyes than the bird's real eyes do. They often perch very conspicuously. I mean, that means right on the open, looking for prey. And this way, having spots in the back of their head will actually deter predators from attacking them from behind. Because predators really don't want to be attacking something that sees them coming. Because if they do, then of course, the prey is going to evade them and they will lose all of their... Um, but the surprise and the prey will probably evade the predator and get away. And so that's another in interesting adaptation that they have. And the nocturnal owls, with the exception of the, the flammulated owl, have very uh, silent flight because they have a fringed edge to their feathers. And so the air flows through the edge of the feather versus around it. And that's what muffles the sound of these nocturnal owls. But pygmy owls, because they're active during the day, they don't need to have a silent flight and they don't have a silent flight. When they fly, they sound very much like a woodpecker or a shrike, because there's no point in having silent flight if you're active during the day. This is a skull of a boreal owl. And the boreal owl has the most asymmetrical ear openings of any owl in the world, which means they can pinpoint their prey extremely well. And the pygmy owl, on the other hand, has symmetrical ear openings like you and I, because pygmy owls locate their prey by sight. In other words, they locate their, their prey by visual cues, versus audio cues. And birds either have ear tufts, such as the eastern and western screech owls, or the long-eared owl. And the, the ear tufts were thought to maybe um, mimic the look of a mammal. And if a mammal's crawling up near this owl, probably wouldn't want to attack another mammal and may leave the owl alone. It also helps break up their silhouette that makes them a little harder to see. Other owls, like the northern sawwood owl and the barred owl, do not have ear tufts. Well, the pygmy owl falls right between those two, and these got little tufts or horns that are actually part of their facial disc that they can raise and lower when they have uh, they see a predator or something that that they find uh, where they want to hide. They'll raise these little corners of their facial disc uh, when they think they're near an intruder. It's also unique among owls. So where do I find these little guys? So I look for pygmy owls in a habitat that consists of ponderosa pine, Douglas fir, aspen, downed logs, ground junipers, junipers, a water source, and kind of big openings in the, in the fields. And that's where I find them. And it's the same habitat I find them in uh, all over the mountains of Estes Park and the Rocky Mountain National Park, which is where I do my research. And here's a map of purple where they're found. They are a sedentary species, and if they do move a little bit, it may be slightly downhill or maybe to a little bit larger area than they will nest in, but they really don't migrate uh, like other species do. And I start looking for these guys right about now. Courtship for these guys starts in mid-February, and they usually start nesting in late April. They have the longest courtship of any owl in North America, and these guys will perch right out in the open. They perch very conspicuously. In other words, they don't try to hide themselves. And so you'll see them perch on the edge of a dead branch. So they're easiest to find this time of year before the trees leave out. And they will just sit <clears throat> as they, they're looking for prey this time of year. It can be both birds and voles or mice because they, they do feed a little bit on insects, but not as often as one might think. 
And so that's why they can perch out in the open looking for voles. And also up here in the mountains, there's not many other avian predators around in their habitat. So they really don't have to worry about being attacked by a bigger predator. Their movements are very rapid. So when the male is, is, is courting a female, of course, he'll perch in the open and sometimes he'll perch, you know, maybe in the tree a little bit. Uh, the smaller birds, pygmy owls, sawwood owls and so forth, they tend to like to perch on a branch so they can get their feet either at least halfway around or all the way around. That way they can grab, have a much tighter grip on the branch itself. Uh, again, here's a picture of one during the day. They again perch very conspicuously out in the open as they vocalize for a female. And then as the female comes by, they'll often see them perch together. Um, sometimes, like in this picture, the, the lower bird is the male because the male is more concerned about me and what I'm doing than the female is. And then once they really start liking each other, you'll see them perch side by side. And the female, of course, is the larger of the two. It's called reverse sexual dimorphism. You see by the photograph there that she's got blood on her bill, which means the male has just delivered food to her, gave her something to eat, and she has just eaten and the amount of food the male brings the female during courtship has a direct correlation to the amount of eggs she's going to lay. Because she has to make sure that, that uh, the number of young she's going to raise, the male's gonna be able to find enough food to feed both her, himself, and all the youngsters. So I have found uh, 18 different nest sites of these birds over the years. And I always look for what I call a micro habitat which is an area of within their territory where the nest site is going to be. And it's often in the same type of habitat. It's in the, on the edge of the woods because uh, they don't want to fly very far into the woods to deliver prey. And it's often in um, a, uh, aspen, can be in other trees, but mostly in aspen. And it's in an area that has, again, spruce, fir, uh, down logs, and so forth. And here's a, a nest, the lowest nest I ever found, which was 11 feet, eight inches off the ground. And this tree, this photograph, you'll see a couple of times during this particular video or presentation, because the middle tree in that photograph, I actually had three different species of owls nesting in that same tree in different years. Again, just an example of their habitat. So the cavities themselves are, again, primarily an aspen. This is a nest I had in, in 98, 99. Here's one I had in 2000. There's one I had in 2010, 2012. Sometimes they'll reuse the same nest um, either consecutively or maybe skip a year and come back again. This is the only one of two nests I found in Ponderosas. This one again, not one of used in two years. And this is the one they used again last year, two years ago. Last year, the male, unfortunately, was vocalizing in his territory for several weeks, and then he just stopped. And then a Cooper's hawk was seen in the territory, which makes me think the Cooper's hawk uh, was able to capture and kill the pygmy owl, and that's why I didn't find a nest last year. What happens during the nesting cycle is after the female has accepted the male and the nest site, the male will then hunt for both the female and himself, and she just stays inside the nest. He will capture prey, usually eat a little part of it, and then deliver the rest of it to the female. So what do these guys eat? Well, they eat things like northern pocket gophers. They'll eat warblers and other birds. Even will take youngsters, nestling birds. They take chipmunks, voles, deer mice, and even some more unusual birds like horned larks. Now, how do I know this? How do I know this is what they feed upon? Well, very simply, this, pygmy owls, the adult male loves to go and raid bird nests and bring other birds to his nestlings. Because it's a lot easier taking a defenseless baby bird than it is trying to capture a bird that can maybe hurt him. 
This is a juvenile, a nestling baby robin that the pygmy owl took. This is a chipmunk. They love chipmunks. This is a horned lark. Actually, this actually was taken right in my front yard. Uh, we had a really bad winter storm and the horned larks, they were starting to migrate up to the, to the tundra. And they stopped in Estes Park and they came up to my yard to eat millet. And this pygmy owl came and took this horned lark right in my front yard. See if we get a nice picture of it. This is a vole. They love to take voles. This is a yellow rumped warbler. That's a deer mouse. How do they capture prey? Kind of like this. No way there's no sound to this video, so that's but that's what they do. They'll, they'll make they're pretty amazing how they kind of you can see the eye spots again on the back of the bird's head as he turns around. They don't like to spend a lot of time on the ground because they're pretty much defenseless once they've got something in their feet and they're on the ground. And so they are um, want to get off the ground as quickly as possible. So they try to get their prey um, captured and in a relatively good grip to fly off with. But sometimes they miss and the prey gets away. So what happened is during the courtship and nesting cycle, um, the male will come in with prey and he'll call to the female because he's not allowed in the nest after she's accepted it. So he'll come near the nest, he'll vocalize to the female, and she comes to him, grabs the prey in her mouth, and he'll deliver it back into the nest to feed the youngsters. Or the, the male will call and then the female may just look out of the hole and he'll come and deliver the food right to her mouth to mouth. Or if she does not come out, he'll actually have to take the prey inside and deliver it to her and then fly back out again. As long as she knows he's coming, everything's fine. This is kind of a fun story I watched that happened after the young hatched at one of my nest sites. So the adult female was perched on this branch, just kind of looking around, <clears throat> resting. And I heard a bunch of robins making this huge ruckus as they kind of flew in toward the nest. And then I noticed they chased a, a cooper's hawk into the right near the pygmy owl nest. And right away when the pygmy owl saw the cooper's hawk, it did that. It got itself really thin and raised its little horns. Then as the cooper's hawk flew by and watched the cooper's hawk fly away, being chased by the robins, then it went back to the middle position and then got just acted like nothing ever happened. It was kind of a cool little thing to get pictures of. So watch the video. It's kind of fun to see what, what actually happens here. So the tree the tree's actually moving in the wind. And that bird just came up. Everybody thinks that's a squirrel. But again, pig male is only really seven inches long. That was a chipmunk that it delivered to its nestlings. So it usually takes about three weeks, and then the young start looking out of the nest. And this is a nest I had in 2013 with one of the youngsters looking out. And then they can look out anywhere from just a few days to a few, um, just a few days to a few, um, maybe a week or more before they jump out of the nest. And then sometimes you get two looking out of the nest at one time. This is in the 2020. So what's neat about that is there's that fly. Gives you an idea how small that, that hole is about one and seven eighth inches across. And there's, that's how those little guys, the baby pig meows are so small, their head's about the size of a quarter. So I like to capture the adults uh, whenever I can to identify who's nesting where. So I divide this little trap that I set up and then I capture the adult birds near the nest. Um, and this is the adult male in my hand. And there's a, a, a recently fledged bird Another male. So you can see how little they are. Again, they're only seven inches from head to tail. They weigh about um, 70 grams, which is two ounces. And to process them, of course, I check to make sure, look at the feather pattern, feather wear, put a band on the bird, um, check for any kind of mold patterns, take a picture or two, and then just let them go. We weigh the birds as well if we can and so forth. And then the youngsters, again, they start looking out of the nest about two weeks, three weeks um, old. Then in about a month, you'll see them fledge. And then they jump out. I try to get there when they fledge because pygmy owls 
because their diurnal will fledge first thing in the morning. Then the nocturnal owls, like sawwood owls, boreal owls, and so forth, will usually fledge just at dark. So I try to be there. Usually I get there if sunrise is, say, 5.30 or 6. I try to get there about 7. So the birds are already out of the nest. Because they will not jump out of their nest. They will not fledge if I'm standing there watching them. So I think you got to be there a little later or I've got to stand behind the tree and wait for them to come out. So how do we catch the fledglings? Of course, they're out of the nest. And how do we catch them? We have some kind of big elaborate trap, or do we just simply watch up and just reach over and pick them up? Because they usually land on the ground or close to it, and I can just reach over and pick them up. Um, pretty easy to do. And there's a fledgling right in my hand. You should see how tiny they are compared to my hand. It's really about three and a half inches long at that point. And then, of course, do we band them as well, measure their little wing and tail and so forth. And this is weighing one. So this guy's lit sitting on my, my scale. He weighs 58.1 grams. There's 28.35 grams per ounce. He weighs less than two ounces. Takes about three weeks before they, um, uh, three weeks to a month before they're actually independent. This is a, a three-week-old owl that's feeding a, on a chipmunk, but I think the parent probably killed a chipmunk and delivered, delivered to the youngster there. Now this is the flammulated owl. Is this flammulated owl is the smallest North American owl that has dark eyes. All the other small owls have yellow eyes. And it's called the flammulated owl because it has these flammulated or flaming or rusty scapular feathers. That's where the bird gets its name from. And the habitat is very, it's identical to the, the uh, pygmy owl because again, it's downed logs, aspen, you know, uh, Ponderosa, Douglas fir, ground junipers, and so forth. Um, and the nest for this particular bird was right here, right in the middle of that tree. A lot of times the flams like to have a branch right near the nest cavity because the male likes to land on near the nest on a branch before he goes in to feed uh, the, the female or the youngsters. Their habitat goes a little farther south than the uh, pygmy owls do. All the birds in North America will actually migrate to Mexico for the winter time. And then what happens is the, the male comes into a spot he likes and he will start uh, find a nest site he likes and he'll start flying around the territory vocalizing for a female. And then when she arrives, she'll take her to the nest, often sit inside, maybe deliver a moth or two for her um, and feed her. And then hopefully she decides this guy's a pretty good guy. They'll fly throughout their territory. He will kind of show her where the territory is, kind of what he's picked. And then um, what they feed upon are pretty much entirely insects, moths, and other in, other items, small flying insects, sometimes on ground nesting insects or beetles. And then once the nest is chosen, the female will be in the nest both day and night. And then she'll start incubate, laying her eggs. You can always tell when the eggs are laid because the male will be feeding the female about once a minute for the first couple hours after dark. And that goes on for about three or four nights after the eggs are laid. That way she can rejuvenate her calcium. And this is a nest I had in 2004. A lot of times a little flam nest will have, be an older aspen cavity that has some type of dark warty substance around it. That way it helps, seems, seemingly helps the female remain more uh, concealed if she's looking out of the hole. The nest I had in 2008, this is one I had in the dead ponderosa, but also this female is very well camouflaged. This is one I had um, last year in a beautiful aspen. So then <clears throat> this is the male. Again, he feeds the female during incubation. He feeds her very quickly and very rapidly the first three or four nights uh, after the eggs are laid to, so she can re rejuvenate her calcium. Then just a few insects uh, per hour he feeds her as she's just sitting there. As you can see, he, and every delivery he makes is one insect, and every delivery is in his mouth. So he'll capture this with usually sometimes his mouth, but primarily his feet. He'll deliver it from his mouth to his feet, excuse me, from his feet to his mouth, and make delivery to the female while the insect in his mouth. He goes in, delivers it to her mouth to mouth, and exits head first. So, uh, <clears throat> and after the eggs have hatched, of course, He'll be feeding when the chicks get to anywhere from a couple days to a couple of weeks, depending on um, what the female feels like. She'll actually go and start hunting as well. 
Sometimes it'll be just the male hunting for the first week or two. Other times it could be the female hunting just after the chicks hatch. And you can see they'll come up, they'll land uh, either on the nest or near it and then fly directly into it. But the food's always in their mouth when they deliver the food mouth to mouth to the chicks. Then the nestlings start looking out at about three weeks or so, depending on the depth of the cavity. And sometimes you'll get two of them looking out at the same time. I mean, these holes are real little. They're like I said, flicker cavities, which are less than two inches in diameter. Mm -hmm. And so um, the little ones when they look out can kind of fill the entire cavity with just their little heads. And then they get they fledge at about 30 days or so. Usually then these guys fledge just at dark. If there's two owlets, a lot of times they'll, they'll fledge uh, the same night. Other times, if there's only two owlets, they'll fledge one this day and then one like one tonight, one tomorrow night. If there's three or more owlets, it may take over a two or three, three night uh, for them to fledge. Others will both fledge the same night. There's really no rhyme or reason to why they fledge or when they fledge. But here you see two little owlets sitting uh, pretty close to each other. And to catch these little guys it's the same way, I just reach up and pick them up. Because a lot of times they're only just a few inches off the ground. So you can just reach over and pick them up. And you can see this little guy is physically standing on my hand. I'm not holding him. This is a wild owl. The only thing it's ever seen in its lifetime is its mom and me. Mom and dad and me, of course. And so when I capture them, um, I can ban them and then put them in a nice safe place. And again, they sit on my finger. And uh, and they're really a very weak little owl. They can't even break my skin. Uh, their feet aren't strong enough to break the skin uh, because they're only catching our insects. So once they fledge, this is what they look like when the night they fledge. And then it takes them about a month to go from they molt, actually, they'll, they'll grow their contour feathers over their down feathers. So it takes about a month for them to go from juvenile to adult plumage. And so they usually fledge in July or early August. And then by October, they, they're pretty much all gone from the area. The northern sawwet owl is so named because one of its calls sounds like someone sharpening a saw on a whetstone. And the scientific name of this bird is uh, Egolius acaticus. Egolius means a type of owl, and acaticus because one of the first specimens was actually found near Acadia, New York. And so their habitat, again, is identical to the flam and the pygmy, because I've actually had, there's that photograph again you saw. So in 1998 and 1999, I had a pygmy owl nest in that tree, the middle tree there. And in 2004, a flammulated owl nested in the exact same hole that the pygmy owls used. And in 2007, pygmy owls returned to that same tree and nested again in a different hole. In 2008, northern solid owls nested in that same tree again in a different hole. In the winter of 2008, the tree fell down. That's why all I knew all three species like the same habitat. So when looking for these guys, again, same type of habitat, but it can, can be often at little higher elevations than the pygmy owl's nest. And these guys, the male will roost usually away from the nest during the day. And he, the, pig, the, the solid owl will roost in a different location every day based upon where he ends up that night or that morning. So he's hunting throughout his territory at night. Wherever he ends in the morning is where he's going to roost for that day. So they're really hard to find roosting during the day because they're not in the same location from one day to the next like horned owls might be doing. And so the green is where they, they nest and, and of course the blue is where they winter. Males, at least in Colorado, tend to stay in their territories year round. And then the females and juvenile birds wander. I do not believe they migrate, I believe they wander. The reason I say that is because um, I've been banning owls for 11 or 12 years now and only had recaptured one owl in the same place I originally captured it. And if these birds had a specific migration north to south coming back to the same location again, I would be capturing a higher percentage of birds in the same location each year. So again, courtship begins in January, sometimes December or January with the male calling. And his call is very, just as the simple, like the pygmy owl, just a very simple one toot per second, kind of a well, she was usually more than uh, one and a half or one call every uh, two calls per second, kind of like. And then when, when the female arrives, you'll see often see them perched side by side. They'll be duetting. You often hear them calling to each other with the male's voice slightly deeper than the female's. And he'll fly throughout his territory, showing her what the territory is. 
and often where the nest cavity is. He'll actually sit inside the nest cavity, call from the cavity, and then exit the cavity and fly around her to get her to go back inside the cavity. That's where he can see if she likes the cavity or not. These guys start actually nesting uh, in March. And the reason they do that is because they're hunting primarily deer mice and mice move above the snow. So it makes it more advantageous for them to hunt when there's snow on the ground because their deer mice are very easy to see because it's a dark mouse on top of a white background. So sometimes again, they nest in the same cavity from one year to the, to the next, but these guys readily take to nest boxes. That's why I have so many nest boxes placed for them because I've seen them in my nest boxes numerous times. And that's really nice to be able to identify what they're feeding upon and also when the eggs are laid, what the eggs look like and how many eggs it actually laid. So this photograph, this is 2020, that's the exact same cavity that Northern Sawwood Owl was used in 2019. So I mean, so, to, so I apologize. To where it says 2020 in the upper left, that same cavity is a cavity Northern Pygmy Owl was used in 2019. The Sawwood used it in, in 2020. Here's the pygmy owl A or solid owl eggs as pygmy owl eggs are white. They're small, they're white. They're about uh, maybe a quarter to a half size of a chicken egg. And then the female incubates exclusively. She'll be on the, the nest for about 30 days. And in my nest boxes, they'll actually lay more eggs and raise more chicks than they will in the natural cavity. Because if they're nesting in a flicker cavity, they can't really fit more than two owlets plus mother plus all the food inside a flicker cavity. But because my boxes are much bigger, I can raise more owlets in my nest boxes. Here you see there's five eggs in my um, my nest box, where normally they only raise two. And that red feather you see there is a flicker uh, flicker went into used the winter in the in that nest box, but then the saw was ended up using it. That's a flicker nest it was a molted flicker feather. And so then what the male does is he'll actually sit <clears throat> and perch outside the nest box in a various, like I said, locations during the day. And sometimes I can find them just by whistling. Sometimes they will return my sound and I can just walk up and see where they are. Other times maybe a, ch a junk or a chickadee may vocalize and I can go up and figure out what the, what the bird is vocalizing about. And then they're harassing a saw and all this so I can find the birds during the day. So what do they feed upon? Primarily deer mice. They also take voles on occasion. They'll take small songbirds like chickadees and juncos, occasionally even bigger prey like a half-grown rat, uh, even birds the size of robins sometimes. But primarily, if they really want deer mice is what they want. The various owl species really have a certain prey item they prefer. So how do they hunt? Well, they perch very low to the ground, usually less than six feet off the ground, and just listen or look for a mouse to come by, and they can quickly pounce on the ground, grab the mouse, and fly off. These are nestlings, anywhere from one to three days old. The gray stuff you see is fur. The, um, the deer mice that you can see in the upper corner that the, the male brought to the female, she pulls the fur off and just feeds the meat and bones to the little ones. And so that's all fur around the youngsters there. This is uh, one of the nestlings at about, was that nine days old? And here's uh, a whole family. There's actually five owls in there, three weeks old. And then in about 30 days, you'll see they look more like this. And then when they come real close to fledging, they'll sit at the edge of the hole and look out the hole. Because it's because they've all they've ever seen their entire life is usually their mom and dad, their siblings, and this little hole where light's coming in during the day. And so they have to jump up there and see what this is all about. And it takes them a while for them to focus on the area around them and also get enough nerve to actually fledge and leave the nest. And of course, once they fledge, I often can find them near the nest itself, often perched right next to the trunk. And because these are nocturnal birds, they fledge just at dark. So um, when they fledge at dark, if I'm not there, I try to get there the following morning. I can usually find them to uh, capture and ban them and look at what we call nest site fidelity and see if they would return to the same nest site from one year to the next, and they just do not. So when these birds were first, first found back in the 1700s, Researchers thought that this bird and this bird were two separate species. They didn't realize that a northern sawwood owl normally start nesting in March, they fledge in May, but they will stay in their juvenile plumage, the picture on the left, until September and then molt from juvenile to adult plumage. And that takes about a month. 
And so until they started learning more about the owls, they thought there was those were separate species. And so the sawwood owl molts from juvenile to adult plumage, where the flammulated owl just grows its contour feathers over its down feathers. This is the boreal forest. And the boreal forest is the forest up where you guys live. Uh, it's also here above 9,000 feet. And it's an area that consists of usually Douglas, Douglas fir and um, Ingleman spruce. And within that type of habitat, the boreal forest, which if you're lucky, you'll find <clears throat> what I call the boreal owl. I don't call it, that's what it's actually called. And the boreal owl is uh, an owl most people never see. Most birders have the boreal owl on their life list as herd only, simply because they're a really hard bird to locate. Because when they start uh, vocalizing in usually February and March, they're in areas uh, that can be you know, up to six feet of snow, so getting to them can be extremely difficult. So most people can hear them in the spring vocalizing, but various people have actually seen them. And so if you look at the range of the boreal owl, you see that they're actually in Colorado, New Mexico, um, Washington State, Oregon, and so forth. This bird has a very unique history in Colorado. Historically, the bird was only found, um, it's considered a winter visitor in the lower 48 states, until a couple of researchers from Fort Collins CSU named Dr. Ron Ryder and Dave Palmer started researching those birds and found them up at Cameron Pass, northwest of Fort Collins, and actually documented the first nesting pair of boreal owls, I believe 1977 or 78. So that bird has a really unique history. And some of their students went to other parts of the West and found them nesting in other parts of the West. And that's how the bird, now the range map is what it is, based upon the research started in Fort Collins. Mm -hmm. And these guys nest um, in uh, cavities as well. This photograph you're seeing here is the first documented nest of a boreal owl in the history of Rocky Mountain National Park. This is the male who is roosting in the box, the cavity during the day. And this is the female once she accepted him in the box, the cavity at night. And I could tell male from female based upon the amount of white in the upper corners of their facial disc. You see the picture on the left, the male has much more white than the female on the right does. So this is what the male bull sounds like and looks like when he's vocalizing. Interesting thing about boreal owls is they only defend the nest tree. They don't defend the territory. So if you can find any vocalizing, you're not going to be very far from the nest itself. Now, the next video you're going to see, you're going to hear the male and female calling. You're going to hear that call you just heard, which is the male, and you hear kind of a tss. That's the female calling. There's a female entering the cavity. And you can tell it. So I can always tell who is delivering food, male or female, based upon how they entered the cavity. If the male would just drop off food and fly away, the female would have physically go all the way inside the cavity to feed the youngsters. That's how I can tell the male versus the female as far as who's delivering to the nest itself. So there's the difference. The female goes inside, the male just drops off and leaves. That's the male about to deliver praise. That's why he was vocalizing to see if the female was around. And he was calling and also the, the youngsters inside the nest, food baking back to the male.
that was always very scary watching the squirrels because the squirrels, if, they, if the female was not in that cavity, the squirrels would have probably been able to be able to capture, kill, and eat the nestlings. I actually had a pair of a family of uh, a family of northern pygmy owls captured and eaten by a squirrel one year. So it's always it's always I'm glad that the female boreal owl was in the cavity so that the squirrel couldn't eat the youngsters, and that the boreal owl could have killed a squirrel, but for something they just never did. At least not that we saw. This is their two nestlings that year, and I can tell the difference between the two because one had much more white on its uh, facial disc than the other one did. And here's the two little ones. Then I happened to be there the night that the first owl had fledged. I was able to capture and band it. And then when it, there's the, uh, and then I, after I banded it, I put in this, the, the picture on the left, I put it in that branch. I just so it'd be a little more camouflaged. But then the following day, I went, the following night, I went back to check the second one, but the second owl had fledged during the day, which I was not expecting. And then the two owls were together but they're almost impossible to find um, once they've fledged the nest. So I tried to figure out how many boreal owls were in Rocky Mountain National Park because when I first started my research back in 1993 is when I found my first boreal owl in the park, but I never heard more than one bird calling at a time. So I <clears throat> got a permit from the Park Service. I'm actually a park researcher. Got to change my permit from the, from the Park Service to actually capture and ban boreal owls in the fall. And so, because I wanted to figure out how many boreal owls were actually there and do they actually nest in the park. Well, I assume, assumed I was going to set up my nets and my traps and I was going to capture one male boreal owl and go home. Well, the first night when we set up our nets, we set them up in an area called Hidden Valley in um, above 9,000 feet and we found some little net lines we could use. We set up a series of nets in kind of a big U shape. We broadcasted the call of the owl. And then uh, that first night, we captured just a photograph of the first boreal owl ever captured in the park. And within a few, um, probably a half hour, we caught our first boreal owl. And it was a juvenile uh, female, which proved right away that boreal owls nest in Rocky Mountain National Park without finding a national nest because we caught the birds in September and they wouldn't have actually left or moved out of their natal ground or nesting area before September. So that documented that they nested in the park, but in, nine, in 2019, actually finding the nest solidified that. Uh, we also would capture sawwood owls at the same time. We would try to capture both boreals and sawwood owls because they both nest in the same habitat. You often frequently find them together. And at one point, um, once the birds were captured, we put a band on the bird's leg first, measure their wing um, as a, a boreal owl. We weigh the birds, we look for fat, uh, we look at the wing under a black light to look how old they are. And um, this is a, a juvenile boreal owl. And I know that because all the feathers are the exact same color. And so young birds, once they're born, of course, they hatch. All the feathers grow at the exact same rate. They're all the same color, all the same tone. That's how you can tell they're juveniles. But as adult birds, they have a partial molt, which you can see here you have new feathers, old feathers and by my left hand, you'll see what's, where it says VO kind of right here, that VO. So you have the new feathers here, old feathers here, and then this is VO, which is very old. And I know this because white feathers do not have as much keratin in them as dark feathers do, therefore they're weaker. And so white feathers deteriorate faster than dark feathers do. And so by looking here, you can see this white is gone that's how we know these are three years old. These birds have what's called a three-year molt rotation. They, roll, they molt a series of feathers this year, another series of feathers next year, and a third series of feathers the following year. Then the, the fourth year, they go back and molt the same series again. And so they have a three-year molt rotation. When you're aging birds, you only age them hatching year, which means they were caught the year they hatched. Second year, which means they hatched the year before they were caught, or after second year, which means they could be three years old, six years old, nine years old, so forth. So you have to think backwards when you're trying to age the birds. But what really helps is this, is to look at the bird's wing under a black light. And what that does, it allows the porophins or blood stains essentially to um, reflect back pink looking at a black light. And because looking at this bird, all the feathers are pink. This tells me this bird was born the year it was captured. Now this feather has both, 
this photographs have both pink feathers and blue feathers, which means this bird was captured the year after it hatched. So this bird would be a second year bird. And then this bird, you see there's three different layers of pink. Some pink goes almost down to the edge of the feather. Some pink goes halfway down the feather and then some feathers are blue. So this bird would be an after second year bird or three year, six year, nine year or whatever it is. So that's how we age the birds using the black light. One night I actually was able to capture a boreal and a sawan owl together. The boreal owl on the, on the left, that's Egolius, Egolius fenarius. Egolius fenarius means, Egolius means a type of owl and fenarius because the, the call sounds like a funeral like or deafening. Uh, and that's where the bird gets its scientific name from on the right. Egolius acadicus again because Egolius is a type of owl. Acadicus because one of the first specimens was found near Acadia, New York. The bird on the, on the boreal owl is an adult female, and the sawan owl is an adult male. So you can see the big size difference between the two. And so once the birds are processed, they're just really just put on a branch and released back into the wild again. So I like to talk a little bit because I do bird rehabilitation as well as the bird uh, banding. I like to do uh, talk just a little bit about some of the problems these birds run into. A lot of birds, believe it or not, owls actually crash into windows at night, just like songbirds crash into windows during the day. This is a little guy that was hit by a car and he had a, a broken wing and he lost his left eye and he was unreleasable. So he spent uh, the rest of his life at the Birds of Prey Foundation in Broomfield. Because saw when owls migrate relatively, relatively low to the ground, they run the risk of getting hit by cars, which this one did. This one was attacked by a cat because they roost very quietly during the day and sleep and the cat snuck up on him and grabbed a hold of him and realized it wasn't any fun to play with, let it go but severed the, the nerves in the bird's wrist and the bird could not fly again. Again, he spent the rest of his life at a rehab center as well. He ended up dying of West Nile virus. This is a Northern pygmy owl. They often hunt near homes during the day, especially in the winter as they, they hunt near bird feeders. This guy flipped, crashed into a window, had a bit of a headache, but he was released. This is a great horned owl that I rehabilitated. It actually lost its mother, fell out of the nest. And so because he lost his mother, I gave him a little feather duster. He would hide under the feather duster and I put a, a heating pad under, underneath him so he could feel the warmth of what he thought was his mother. He would come out and hand feed him and go back underneath the feather duster. And as he, he got a few weeks older and started talking to me, hooting to me, I knew it was time to take him to a rehabilitation center where he could be raised by an adult female horned owl and learn to be how, a horned owl versus to be raised by me and be imprinted on people. There was a sharpshinned hawk that was chasing a robin, hit a window. The robin died, but the sharpshinned had a headache. And then that rehabilitated him and let him go as well. So what can we do to help these little guys? Well, first thing we can do, and the biggest thing that we do is we build nest boxes for them. Again, I've got, you know, 100 nest boxes for saw and owls, 140 boxes for kestrels and so forth. And that's a good way to help these birds nest in a safe location. Uh, and I have volunteers help build, both build the boxes and hang the boxes for me. And then when I find birds in my nest boxes, I often have groups come over and watch the process so they can, number one, see these owls up close, learn about the, the research and the conservation of the birds, see them in, all in real time, and then, of course, put the birds back in the, their nest boxes. And in the fall, when I have my banding station set up, we capture the owls in the fall, and then volunteers come out and uh, also paid guests come out. And that's how we raise money for the project because we have live cameras on the nests to watch these birds in real time. Um, and that's how we can take the birds out of the nets quickly and so forth. And then I also have other people learn how to, to band the birds, learn the process. That way uh, we can create more banding stations and learn more about these owls as they uh, migrate in the fall. So again, I'm the director of the Colorado Avian Research and Rehabilitation Institute, or CARI. And we have a store. And if you look at our store and our website, you can find all kinds of fun stuff. You'll see all of our books. You'll see original art. We have face masks, of course, because of the COVID with my artwork on it. You can buy prints of all kinds. We can buy t-shirts, you can buy hats, you can buy duvet covers, shower curtains, um, all kinds of stuff. And all the money goes right back to help us with our research and rehabilitation of the birds. Again, we have, you know, I've got six books I've written. Um, I've got a beautiful book, um, Saw One Owl, just on Northern Saw One Owls alone. Uh, you can get the books either on Amazon or through us at the Cary store. Uh, I know I told you guys a lot of tons of information, but if you guys have any questions, I'm happy to make up answers for you. 
And I thank you all for attending and I'll answer any questions you guys might have. Thank you so much, Scott. Wow, owls are one of my favorite animals <laughs> and I can, it's always a pleasure of learning um, so much about these very powerful small creatures. Um, please type in your questions to the Q&A box down at the bottom of the screen. Um, and we have time just for a few questions. Um, and then um, if there are, um, we'll try to get those answered as well. Um, I'm going to ask just the first question, just some clarification from, um, is do pygmy owls make their own nest holes or occupy abandoned nests? Uh, pygmy owls, none of the owls actually, the only owls that theoretically make their own nest cavities are burrowing owls. They, of course, they will, they will burrow in the ground. If the ground is soft enough, they can actually excavate their own burrow. Uh, if the ground is soft enough, but they usually use prairie dog nests. And barn owls have actually known to, to enlarge a cavity in, like, say, a sandstone cliff. But no, the owls do not build. And pygmy owls are the only owl I know of that will not live in a nest box. No one's ever had a northern pygmy owl nest in a nest box. Ferruginous pygmy owls, yes, but I don't know of anybody who's ever had a northern pygmy owl nest in a nest box. They just prefer natural cavities. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, here's another question from one of our ACES naturalists, uh, Kathleen. Uh, how long will parent owls continue feeding their owlets after they've fledged? It varies on the species. Um, most of them are only with the youngsters for like the little owls are with their um, adults for about a month and then they're on their own. Uh, great horned owls will stay with their youngsters for sometimes up until the eggs hatch the following year. That's why there's so many great horned owls, because the parents are great providers and great parents, and they, they can stay, allow the kids to stay with them until the following nesting season, at which time they come, become competition. That's why there's so many horned owls, because the parents are great teachers, and they allow the, the parents to, and also the bigger the, the bigger the bird of prey, the more vast their prey species can be like a horned owl could capture everything from a half grown turkey all the way down to a, a beetle or a moth or a, 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 a snake or whatever where like a pygmy owl can only capture things like the size of a chipmunk it clearly can't take things much bigger than that because it's not that much bigger the biggest thing i've ever seen a pygmy owl with is a northern pocket gopher which actually weighs almost twice what the pygmy owl weighs Wow, that's a, that's a that's a scene i'd like to see <laughs> um, <laughs> this is um, also from one of our naturalists. Um, they are wondering about if the small owls partition their habitat, their shared habitats, in terms of food resources or hunting strategies. Uh, what's really interesting is the reason that I have numerous times I've had pygmy owls and saw what owls nesting a few yards apart at the exact same time. And the reason that works so well is because the saw what owls hunting totally after dark the pygmy owl is hunting totally during the day. And the pygmy owl takes, depending on where the nest site is for the pygmy owl, they take a lot of birds or they'll take a lot of voles and chipmunks where the sawwood owl can hunt in the same habitat, but they're hunting mostly deer mice and deer mice are active after dark where the voles are active during the day. So sawwood owls start nesting when there's snow on the ground on purpose because that's when the, the deer mice are easier to capture Pygmy owls nest after the snow is gone on purpose because they need to capture voles and voles are moving under the snow. So you got to wait till the snow is gone. So they can, and then the flams, if they're nesting in the same habitat, are feeding on insects. So there's literally no competition between the three species. Excellent. Thank you so much. There's a number of questions about nest box <laughs> sizes. Um, and if you They're all on my website. Have plans um, on or website. on your website? Excellent. Yep. They're all on the. There's a whole web page that, that just says on the right hand side. You'll see there's a whole description of of nest box sizes. Um, and we also do build boxes and we sell them. They're sixty five dollars a piece. We build them. We place them, um, and we have people hopefully monitor them on their properties and so forth. And then if the location has both power and Wi Fi, we can put a camera inside the box and monitor the birds in, in, in real time. And if you look at our website, you'll actually see we have cameras up right now. We've got flickers in two of our kestrel boxes. We've got a, a male kestrel that roosts in one of our boxes at night. Uh, we've got horned owls checking out one of our platforms right now. 
and we'll probably have barn owls here in just a few weeks. Excellent. And um, this is from Craig Ward. How vulnerable are the owlets once they've fledged? And you touched on that. But. <laughs> they're totally vulnerable to everything, uh, but they're really hard to find. Again, pygmy owls, when they, a full grown pygmy owl is about seven inches from head to tail. So when they're first born, they hatch, their tail is only an eighth of an inch long. So you're looking at a three and a half inch bird that is going to remain camouflaged and sit perfectly still. So predators usually walk right past it. And all the small, all the owls, no matter what species it is, they do not sound, the food begging call of the owl does not sound anything like the adult's territorial call. So predator, other, other birds don't even know that this baby owl is a baby owl. For example, the food begging call of a pygmy owl sounds like a grasshopper. The food begging call of a, of a flam sounds like somebody opening a pop bottle. It just goes, psh, 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 where the, the, the flams actually hoot. And so um, they don't sound, that's why they're, they're, if like a cooper's hawk or a goshawk or something is in the area, they, they could, if they see the bird out in the open, they'd pick it off pretty quickly. But they don't tend to stay out in the open really at all. I can, I've got tons of pictures of, of the little baby owlets roosting, and you, if you didn't know where to look, you'd never see the owl. Wonderful. I think that that is our time for today. Um, but thank you so much, Scott, for your wonderful presentation. And thank you all for joining us this evening for our first Naturalist Nights. And please check out our websites for the future talks and um, check out Scott's website as well um, if you had some unanswered questions. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Have guys. A wonderful evening. Have a good night. See you, guys. Thank you.